Colleagues, good evening. A warm welcome to everyone. We're just letting a few, probably about another minute go by just to see if we can manage to get everybody before we get started. But our numbers are rising. It looks like we are, we may be approaching the 200 very soon. So a warmest welcome to everyone. Um, let me introduce myself. Sorry, messages keep popping up and I'm trying to get rid of them. There we go. Let me introduce myself. My name's Jackie Gillen and I'm an ELC service manager with the Care Inspectorate. And the warmest welcome to, to everyone tonight for joining this webinar. The second of these webinars, we had the first one last week where we had just shy of 400 people on the call last week. And I think that says something, doesn't it? That says something about the ELC's need to connect, to reflect, to have a space, to have a national conversation, to talk about what it was like to work with children and families across the sector during the pandemic. And we were very keen at the Care Inspectorate to work collaboratively with Dr James McTaggart, who will be known to a lot of you. Um, I'll introduce James and indeed my, my colleague Lynn, who's led on this project. Lynn Alexander um, is an ELC inspector that might be known to some of you on the call tonight. So just to say a little bit about the context for tonight, we were very keen, as I just indicated earlier, to, to create this space to just kind of pause and reflect and see what the sector's experiences have been and working on a very challenging time, not just during the pandemic, but you know, managing all the ELC expansion. We've got a cost of living crisis. So you know, I want to begin tonight by just thanking everybody for joining up and the majority of people on this webinar tonight will probably have been working with children and families all day today. So whether you're a childminder that's been, you know, working across the day in your home and in your community, an ELC practitioner from the private, the voluntary, um, from local authority, setting our colleagues in out of school childcare. Thank you for committing your time tonight. And I would probably uh, take a calculated guess that some of you haven't had your food, haven't had tea, and um, maybe still running a to-do list to do with children and homework and um, you know, taking dogs out for a walk and all of these things. So in true ELC fashion, I just want to um, really, you know, very, very genuinely say thank you for extending your day and attending this webinar. And in good ELC fashion, we'll go gentle and we'll go quite slowly. We want this to be a, a good space for people and we'll try and be patient. Um, I'm saying that because I recognise whilst we've all grappled with this great opportunity to, to work with technology during the pandemic, things can go wrong and things can go wrong at our end and things can go wrong at your end. So, you know, let's not stress about that. We'll we'll find a solution and we'll find a way forward. We're just absolutely delighted to have you here tonight. So we're here and we're starting, you know, half past six as we've got started and, you know, we're running on to eight o'clock and we want to make sure that, you know, if if we can, if we had people in a room, we'd have hot drinks, we'd have homemade scones and we'd have fresh flowers. So I'm trying to create that ambience for people in terms of, you know, feeling relaxed and, and participating tonight. However, we, we have got some challenges in terms of the participation opportunities, given we have so many people on the call tonight. So in order to try and ensure that we run as smooth as we can, we have had to um, not have the message function just now and not um, asking you gently if you could try and not use the, the hand function just now, 
But I want to reassure you that we've tried to create as many opportunities as possible for people to participate. And James will certainly encourage that in his presentation. And also, Caroline, if you're, if you're all right to pop up that other slide, I just want to flag up to people now that please just note down any burning question, comment, query, reflection that you would like to share or to ask James or myself. And, you know, time allowing, we're trying to create a space at the end to take those questions and to take those comments. But I also want to just remind everyone that tonight is the start of this national conversation where we at the Care Inspectorate were very, very keen to, to listen, to learn, to work in partnership with the sector across Scotland to try and see how we can best support um, this post-pandemic recovery period. So following this, the session tonight, we will also be we will be issuing a, a survey to the sector, quite a thorough survey that will allow you to give us more information to tell us how how things are for your children and families. And we'll say more about that at the end because we want to gather that information about children's play, about family engagement and really widen our understanding about how to best support the sector. I wonder if at this point I could just ask my uh, colleague Lynn Alexander, who's an inspector that's led on the project, to pop her camera on and for James to pop his camera on so everyone can, can see you both. Here we go. <laughs> James. James will be, as I said, well known to a lot of people. Uh, James works in Highland Council as a principal educational psychologist and also, um, James, is it, do you not work in Highland Council, James? I'm not the principal educational psychologist. Give me your <laughs> no, full title. In, have, I, have I given you promotion? You're always promoting me, I know. That's fine. <laughs> so will I miss the principal and just say educational psychologist, James? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, just like me, I can go now. You don't want me here. <laughs> no, you're promoted and demoted in the same sentence. How exciting, James. There we are. So James, James has also, people will probably know, contributed to our national practice guidance and realising the ambition. And I'm sure lots of people will follow James on Twitter. Um, so we are absolutely privileged to have James here tonight and Lynn will say a little bit more as the evening goes on in relation to another key aspect of tonight is that our frontline inspectors um, worked with some key partners, some key providers across the sector and we have four videos to share with you over the course of tonight. And we're really, really pleased to be able to do this because it allows the frontline sector, childminders, nursery, out of school care to share their experiences of what it was like to work during the pandemic and what the challenges and opportunities have been in that period and going ahead. So James will be offering three inputs and we'll have four videos and we'll have chance to participate and to, you know, listen and to hear questions from yourself. So without further ado, what I'd like to do now is just pass over and allow you all to enjoy the first video of the evening, which is from Little Daisy's Daycare and Sarah is going to be speaking about her experience uh, with my with my colleague Lynn. Thank you.
So Sarah, what strength do you think really helped your settings to get through the pandemic? I think for me, having a strong, reliable management team that worked together to overcome some of the difficulties and the, the strengths and the weaknesses that we had to come through and good communication was the most important for us. Communication with the families and the children when we were closed and with staff on the return to opening the nurseries was the most important thing for us. Absolutely, Sarah. And what then was the most challenging element of supporting children and families throughout the pandemic and probably still as you recover from the pandemic too? I think keeping those relationships going that you build with families when you see them on a regular basis, seeing them face to face. And when you have to do that at a distance, it does create, you know, parents have concerns about coming back in and out the nursery with the safety. You know, how are their children going to settle back in? That was a huge concern for a lot of both the staff and the families um, that I feel we overcame and overcame quite well. But it was a, a work in progress. Um, I think the children settling back in was one of the biggest um, difficulties that we or one of the challenges we faced, um, getting them back into routines, being able to follow, especially in the three to five room, routines and structure again and interacting with their peers and speech and language was also a big kind of challenge that we faced when they returning from COVID as well. Absolutely. They're all really challenging elements, aren't they? Yeah. So since then, and you've talked about some of those challenges, have you observed any differences in the way that children are using the spaces and using your environment and even in the way that staff are interacting with children now that they've returned to nursery? Yeah, I find that, that one of the positives that came from it, if you can say a positive from COVID, is the amount of space, we're at, the amount of time we're actually spending outside in an outdoor space. Um, that I would say we probably do more now than we ever did before the pandemic. And the children are really benefiting from that. And as are the staff, with their emotional well-being, just their physical well-being, being outdoor in the fresh air, um, has been a huge positive for us. The spaces indoors, we find that the children took a while to adjust back into exploring their playroom and exploring their play space, um, developing their curiosity, something that we find was a challenge coming back and how they move around the playroom and how they interact with their friends as well. Um, and we found that, you know, the staff inside of things interacting with children really needed a lot of work. We did have a bit of a staff changeover um, when we came back from the pandemic. Some staff didn't return. Um, some of the staff that we took on weren't as experienced or as knowledgeable because they hadn't had that experience on the playroom floor with placements. So again, that interaction with children had to change and how we observe the children and how we interact with them when there is um, challenges like speech and language present as well. I'd love to hear about some of the positive work that you've been doing um, to support that healing process for staff, for children and for their families. So for staff, we've created a new process, um, a more enhanced process when it comes to checking in with them for their wellbeing um, and their practice as a whole as practitioners. We've also encouraged them to take responsibility for staff meetings that they now they now hold the monthly staff meeting um, to give them more autonomy and say over their practice and their setting to make them feel um, like they're part of the whole nursery. Um, we also encourage them to use the health and wellbeing hub and webinars and training that's available to help support them in that process of moving through COVID and coming out the other side. Um, with families, I feel that like we're getting back to doing things like stay and play. We've reintroduced baby breakfast, which has been really well you know, supported by parents. Um, we've also encouraged the families to come into the nursery now, but previously we would do virtual tours and virtual tours that they could share with the children when they were doing an enhanced transition as well. Um, for the children, again, we've done the enhanced transitions from room to room. Um, we've also given them opportunities to reflect on time when it, what it was like during COVID when we first came back after the pandemic and we're continuing to support the children with the enhanced programme that we're doing for training and how to best support our children with their learning by training the staff to a high standard. Is there anyone that you've been working really well with to support those gaps in children and families' experiences? Yeah, we've been working with a well-known training provider in Glasgow um, that's been developing with us a bespoke training um, programme that will see us through the next year. Um, that's tailor-made for what we need for our staff team, our children, who will come in and support us on the playroom floor with the children to observe how our rooms are set up and what we need to do to move the nursery forward, which has been a huge benefit to us and has been really, really well received by the staff so far. 
So it's great to hear how you're working with people, Sarah. But where do you see there's still some gaps and other people that you could be working with to support experiences for children and families? So I feel with um, respect to the care inspection in the past, with the new framework and the new way that the inspections are taking place, I think that having an understanding of what to expect on inspection days, particularly for those staff that have never been through the process before, um, who have maybe came fresh out of college or we have new modern apprentices with us, being able to give them something from the care inspector or working with the care inspector together to give them that advice and information of what inspection day would look like would be a big bonus for our staff and allowing them to feel comfortable with the inspection process and what to expect during the day. So I think for us, I think the having other opportunities to work with others and, um, and families, I would definitely say having more support with when it comes to additional support needs, having peripatetic teachers back in, having speech and language therapists back in, working alongside educational psychologists that some sometimes we've never actually had to do that. And having them back in is a huge benefit and working with other agencies to support the knowledge that our staff need and best to support the children moving forward. Is probably what I would say. There is definitely room for that. Okay, so that was a, a lovely, clear account from Sarah about some of the challenges of the pandemic, some of the positives that emerged, some of the changes, and how there's still some things that aren't quite back as, as she'd like them. And that's really one of the messages from this evening, which is that we've all, us, children, families, been through quite a lot in the last two or three years. We are still needing to recover. But one of the other messages is we probably know what to do and we know what to do with our settings and the children and play and what they need. So my job in this first presentation is to put a little bit of, I suppose, psychology around that, a little bit about how children respond to adversity and how we can help them recover. Can I just do a quick check with my colleagues? Can you see a, a, a mentee slide? Is that showing? Yes, James, we're, we can. Absolutely fantastic, miraculous. The technology is working this far. Let's see how far we, how far we go. Of course, Jackie's introduction is, of course, designed to make me as nervous as possible. So I can, I can barely, I can barely use the mouse on this computer, but I'm going to do my best. So I've put up there a question I am often asked, and I'm totally sure of the answer about this. So I'm going to ask you and, and see what you think. And the question is really, how many years do you think until we no longer see the effects of a pandemic in young children? So if you've not done this kind of thing before, what you do is you go to menti.com. Uh, so it's just e M E N T I dot com and pop in the code you can see at the top of the slide and then it'll invite you just to put in put in a number, whatever your best is. In those you're gonna be ready with the majority. Yeah, we've got some seventy, some fifty, ten. Yeah. Of course, there's an advantage to doing this later because you can see what everybody else has put and make sure you're in the you're in the middle of the middle of the pack. Yeah, five. A generation we have. Yeah. Okay, another one for ten. I'm just fascinated to watch move and, and change. Right? Watch this forever. Um, a lifetime, yeah. Okay, so the, keep those keep those coming in, and I'm going to sh share with you um, some of the answers from research, uh, assuming that I managed to share a PowerPoint. So just bear with me. Keep adding them for, for now, and I'll, we'll come back to it in a minute. Uh, oops. done this wrong. Okay, so colleagues, can you give me a bit of reassurance when a slide appears? Yes, you're fine, James. Is it coming through? I yeah. haven't got it yet. Got it before me. There we are. Isn't that marvellous? Okay, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about recovering and a little bit about play and how those two go together. If you would like to um, have the slides from this presentation 
Um, if you just go to my website, happyandlearning.com, uh, you'll find a link to download the slides if you want to do that now or afterwards. Um, if you have trouble finding them, just, um, or oh, you forget the link, just um, pop me an email and I'll, I'll happily send them to you. Okay, so this was the question I asked you, how long to recover? And we got a whole range of, of answers there. The answer I most often give is this one, which is about 90 years. And that's the answer that the research suggests. Some of you were saying four, seven, ten years, maybe thinking about individual children or groups of children. But if we look at society as a whole, there's a bit of research to support that it's two or three generations worth before we have complete recovery. And that's a bit of a contrast, isn't it, to how some of our politicians, how some of our policymakers, even dare I say some of our local government officials, certainly have some in the press um, talk, as though it's all over, it's done, we're on to the next thing now. But of course, in early learning and childcare, we know something quite different, because we're thinking of the children who were still in the womb during the 2020 lockdown, who will still be in early years until 2027. There's a long way to go. And some of them will continue in, in other forms of childcare for long after that, but we're going to be working with them. We also know, because we can feel it every time we go to the shops, what was a pandemic has morphed into a cost of living crisis. And we know we're working with lots of children from families who are facing situational poverty for the first time, perhaps, they're feeling this squeeze. And there's also the impact of all this stuff on us, because we're human too. We live in the same society, the same culture. There's pressures on us. And then, of course, these children we have now, many of them will have children. And then those children will have children. And there is evidence that the effects of large disasters can pass on through the generations. We need to be really cautious in interpreting this. So please don't go around saying, James says, research says, um, you know, we're all going to suffer for, for 90 years. It needs a bit more cautious interpretation. But there has been research done on previous difficult times, such as a famine um, in Holland that followed the First World War, the impact of the Spanish flu epidemic in 1919. And there's lots of evidence that children can be affected by parental trauma, but that these disasters can have impact across generations, not just through cultural effects, but through the way our genes are expressed. So those studies of famine show that how long people live now relates in part to the diet of their grandparents, whether their grandparents were affected by those famines. As I say, this needs a bit of cautious interpretation. So if you want to know more about this, please do get in top contact with me for, for references and I can give you a bit more background. But it, it just shows how deep and far reaching the effects of really difficult times can. Why am I telling you this? I'm not telling you this because, you know, it's the evening, I'm hungry, I'm grumpy, and I want everyone to feel bad. I'm telling you this for the opposite reason, because we're in a different position than those research studies, because we're not standing at the end of the 90 years looking back, wishing that we'd done this, that, or the other. We are at the start of that 90 years. With the children we're working with, we are at the beginning of how this story will unfold over the generations. And that literally means that we can change that future of the next two or three generations. We are that powerful. We can change the next 90 years. And people studying the effects of a pandemic in 100 years time may look back and say, isn't it good that they did this and this and this in early learning and childcare in Scotland? And I suppose my main message is that what we have to do is actually quite simple. And it's stuff we already know how to do. And it's mostly stuff that we are already doing as well as we can. In order to prove that to you, we need to understand a little bit about how adversity in early life affects children. So I'm gonna take you through a, a hopefully lighthearted look at how adversity can affect children and how that can have intergenerational effects. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to announce and I'm sure many will agree with me that we all need a holiday. It's a dark evening in February. I have no idea how I got through January with the weather and the dark and everything else that was going on. This family ever. I certainly feel I need a holiday. So if you feel like you need a holiday, well, that's good news. So I'm going to ask you to imagine that 
our session this evening is interrupted by a very special visitor. The First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, pops into our webinar. And she has popped in to announce that the Scottish Government is so pleased with all the work that we've been doing to support children in ELC that they're going to send us on a free holiday. It's going to start tomorrow, but we don't have to worry. All the arrangements are made. If you need childcare, that arrangement's made. The arrangements with your employers are made. And it's all inclusive. All the transport will be provided, but we don't even need to pack. So don't panic about packing tonight to be picked up by the taxi tomorrow morning. Everything's going to be provided. You just need to turn up as you are. OK, so let's imagine the taxi arrives tomorrow morning, takes you to the airport where you're offered your suitcase of a holiday, which is going to have everything you need in it. And you're offered, you can have a red suitcase or a blue suitcase, whichever colour you prefer. Those are the two kinds of colours of suitcases, which are there in their two piles. So at the risk of sounding like something from the Matrix, I'm going to ask you now to choose in your head, are you going to pick a red suitcase or a blue suitcase? And I'm going to ask you to remember that. It's sounding a bit like pick a card and remember the card, but just remember red or blue. Which suitcase are you going to pick now? OK, so I'm hoping you've all picked one. And I'm going to ask you to be on your honour and stick with your choice for the next couple of minutes. OK, we get in the plane, we land and here we are in this beautiful place. This may not be your idea of a holiday destination, but it's somewhere I would love to go, Svalbard in the far, far north. I would love to go there, see the northern lights, see the polar bears, experience the chill, uh, see the glaciers. So here we are. It's a lovely place. We're in a beautiful hotel. Let's go upstairs and unpack. OK, so here's where you have to remember, have you got a red suitcase or a blue suitcase? So let's unpack the blue suitcase first. So people who picked a blue suitcase a minute ago, here's what you've got. You've got a warm woolly hat, you've got some nice warm gloves, you've probably got some snowshoes, you've got a nice thick coat, you've got some things which are really great for a holiday in Svalbard. This is where you're not allowed to switch and say, oh, well, actually, I did pick a blue case. Those of you who picked red cases, you've got some flip flops, you've got a pretty out of date looking Superman t shirt, you've probably got some shorts, uh, sun hats, and sunglasses. Uh, and things like that. OK, tough. It's what you chose. So let's imagine how your holiday goes and you'll see where, I, where I'm going with this on the next. I promise. If you've got the blue suitcase, you match the environment. You're going to be super shinari on this holiday. You're going to have such a great time because what you've got matches the environment that you've arrived in. If you pick the red suitcase, mm, you don't really match the environment, do you? You're not going to have a very shinari holiday. You're not going to be particularly healthy because you're probably going to get a chill. You're not going to feel particularly respected or, or included, and you might not have a lot of fun, and you might not even be safe because it's so cold. So you might actually start to act in unholiday ways. You'll start to stick, stick out like a sore thumb. People might start to think that there's even something wrong with you. OK, so what was the point of all this? The point of all this is that child development's really complicated. You know, we go and we learn about Piaget and we learn about this, that and the other and all these, you know, Froebel and so on. It actually comes down to two very basic questions from the point of view of the child growing up from before they're born, way, way, way into their, into their mid-teens. And it's answering two questions. Firstly, what kind of world is this that I've been born into? And then secondly, OK, to do well in this particular world I've been born into, what kind of brain and body do I need to develop? So do I need to develop a brain and body that's good at detecting danger and good at hiding and good at fighting to defend myself because it turns out I've been born into a difficult, and dangerous world? Or have I been born into quite a nice world so I can devote time to developing language and concentration and learning and cooperation with other people so that I match that environment. So it's just like if you'd known where you were going, you'd have taken a suitcase with the stuff you need 
Children pick up messages from their environment about what kind of world it is, and they grow a brain and a body that will help them to thrive in that world. And here's a really important point. You'll pick up a lot of stuff on social media and other places about how children are damaged by their pandemic experiences, um, they're damaged by this, damaged by the other. The bulk of research on children and adversity suggests it's better to talk about adaptation. So children do their best to grow, to match the environment they're born into. So if they're born into a world full of anxiety and difficulty, they will adapt to that. They will grow brains and bodies, which are all about detecting difficulties and responding to them. If they're born into a different world, they'll develop differently. And it's like these trees. There's nothing wrong with the tree on the left. The tree on the left is just growing and adapting to a cold and rainy place. There's nothing particularly right about the trees on the right. They're just growing and adapting to a warm and dry place. So it's far better to talk about adaptation because there's stuff we can do about that. Because the children have been through the last two or three years, they have picked up some messages about what kind of world is this. This is a pandemic world. So we develop for a difficult world. We don't need, as Sarah was pointing out, we don't need so much language. We don't need so much social cooperation. But now we have an opportunity to show them that this is a different world. So what do we want those messages to be? What do we want the answer to that question? What kind of world is this to be? What do we want to tell children about this world? So I'm giving you two alternatives here. There are many, many more uh, on the left. It could be that this remains a difficult and dangerous world. This remains a pandemic type world where the adults are all really stressed and the children are at risk of getting damaged. Or it might be the blue world on the right. Suppose we want them to pick up a message that this is a world that's mostly all right. It has some challenges, but we can usually manage them, especially when we help each other. And no prizes for guessing <clears throat> which of those two messages is the most resilient for long-term recovery. It's the blue one. Children need to discover from their interactions with us, from the experiences we provide, and the spaces that we do that in, that this is a world that's okay. It has some challenges. It has the occasional tree that we can't climb. It has the occasional snack that's delayed. It has the occasional time when there aren't enough paintbrushes to go around. But we can manage those challenges, especially if other people help us. And I hope those examples show how that's actually just a high quality ELC provision where the children have interesting things to do, they have company to do it with, they have sensitive, loving, nurturing adults who talk to them and value them and help them when they have difficulties. And that's the message that will lead to long-term recovery. So this is my first key message of the evening. We need to look out for thinking and practice that's based on ideas of damage and instead think that children have done their best to cope, their best to adapt. But now we can give them different messages about what the world is like and what we need to do. And that we can change and that will have an effect which will be measurable even in 90 years time. Okay, so we're gonna go back to Lynn and Lynn is gonna show another lovely interview with someone from, from the setting, uh, which will continue this theme for us. So I think I've managed to stop presenting Lynn, so it's all yours. Thank you. Thanks for that, James. A wonderful, thought-provoking presentation and really leads me on very nicely to our next video where we speak to Senga Neil from High Flyers Out of School Care, where she reflects on how her service has adapted to the pandemic to meet the needs of children and their families. What would you say were the particular strengths that really helped you, your service, get through the pandemic? The strengths that helped us get through it was actually the support from um, yourselves, obviously, and the parents, the carers. Yeah. Um, 
they were, you know, a massive support for us during the, during the pandemic. And what about in terms of the staff? What sort of different supports did you have in place for staff to help them? Because it was obviously a quite a challenging time for them as well. It was a, it was a challenging time for them as well. We've done um, a lot of training. Obviously, all our staff are fully qualified and first aid trained. Um, and they've done COVID training while we were there. Um, with more than one service, which meant we were there to support each other. Yeah, getting that kind of core support from, from yeah. different services under, yes. under the same group. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. And have you have you kind of noticed any changes in the way that you know children are using spaces or in the way they're interacting with staff? Any differences as a result of the pandemic? Well, the, 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 the children seem to be kinder to each other, to be honest with you, since the pandemic. Um, and also, we've got the outdoor area, so we did use that a lot during the pandemic for the children. We had all the loose parts, etc., out there that they could just go out there and help themselves. You know, play with us with whatever they wanted to play with. So what are some of the, the if you'd be good for you, I think, to, to share some of the positive work that you've done with children and families, you know, during the pandemic, post-pandemic, what do you think is really making the difference at the moment? Everyone adjusted very quickly, considering the pandemic. Um, now as we're, we're recovering, we have to get used to being more open again. The, the problem with during the pandemic, the parents weren't allowed in during the pandemic. Yeah. And it was hard for like, new parents, primary ones that were starting and they hadn't even seen the halls. So it was great when we get back that then meant we could give them a tour of the building. And it meant then, you know, they felt a bit more safer knowing that their children were, you know, safe there. We've, get, we've got um, a member of staff that does uh, an art workshop. Now, when we first started, we used to do that workshop one, maybe two days a week. But as we get busier, more and more children wanted to go to that workshop. So we now have that workshop every day. And also the art workshop, one of the times we had, um, I think you actually were out that day, that we had the exhibition on for the parents for that exhibition. That we'd also done an afternoon tea that day for the parents and that, that was good for the parents to come in and see what their children have been doing yeah absolutely and, and that wouldn't have been possible during covid because no, of no, some of the things no. so do you think that's been important or what difference has it made been able to re-engage with families more after the pandemic it, it's been it's been great because although you speak to the parents at the door or whatever you know when during the pandemic, is the parents weren't allowed to come in to pick their children so up. Who who are you looking forward to kind of working with and re-engaging with in the community now that we're, we're kind of coming out of that? Well, so we've just just at Christmas there, um, we have a choir, and the children. It was good because the they get out to go to the care home, local care home, yep. with the choir, and they were delighted to have them back because that was like two years that we've not been able to do anything like that. Yeah. And, and I think, obviously, I think we understand, you know, we all understand that recovery from, from the pandemic and, and from other things that are, are going on in families' lives, well, you know, recovery from the pandemic will, will take time. So what do you think still needs to be done? What support is needed from the care inspector or from other bodies to help with that? I've had exceptional support during the pandemic from the care inspector, and all I can say is if they could just continue to do so. Yeah, because we've probably had a little bit more involvement with yes. services and more yes. contact. yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so just while well, I'm loading a PowerPoint, I just love what saying about the contact with families again being great, and being back to singing. Did you miss singing? I missed the singing. Um, yeah, being able to do all of those, all of those things. So <clears throat> I'm going to continue this theme of what children need in order to recover and what builds resilience. Um, can I just do a, a check with colleagues again? Have you got a slide with a provocative question on it? Yes, we have, James. OK, I'm almost wishing I hadn't shown you this slide. I'm really nervous showing this slide to people because here's a, here's a slightly provocative question. We're not going to do a mentee on this, OK? because um, I don't want to have, have a riot. Which matters more for children's recovery from the pandemic, to work on their well-being or to work on their learning and attainment? It can be a little bit of a false choice, but if you had to choose one, which would you pick? And 
having been through the ordeal with the suitcases, you probably realise this is going to be a trick question. Um, but of course, what's important for this evening is why it's a trick question. So I want to take you through a little bit of the background to why this question is, is not as obvious as people sometimes think. I'd like to talk about some very important studies which have been done. <clears throat> A lot of you know about the, the ACE studies and uh, other research of that kind where um, people researched whether people had difficult childhoods and then looked for the long-term effects into adulthood. And I shared with you that um, in some ways scary, but also very hopeful research about multi-generational impact of, of, of early adversity and trauma. I want to talk about a, a subset of those which ask a very important question. And these researchers look at parents who experience difficult childhoods. So they experienced adversity and trauma early in their lives, but they turn out to be effective parents. So this is the question about the people who turn out to be okay, uh, who somehow, despite those early experiences, turn out to be parents who provide their children with everything that their children need. And these researchers ask, what's different about these people? What's different for these people? And it turns out that there are two key differences. The first one is stress regulation. They're more able to tolerate stress, to handle stress, but also to regulate stress, to turn down um, feelings of worry, concern, anxiety, rage, terror, what, whatever. They're just more skilled at managing their emotions. And you can kind of see why that would be important for being an effective parent, to be able to handle the stress. Because being a parent, it's, it's, it's one thing after another. You know, it's, it's, it's one catastrophe after another uh, and one stress after another. The other key difference is in something called executive function. So parents who've experienced really difficult childhoods but turn out to be very, very good parents themselves, they're quite high in executive function. So what's that? Well, there's a lot about this in, in realising the ambition, but it's basically this cluster of skills in remembering, in planning actions, in being able to choose between different alternative actions. What should I do? Should I do this or should I do this? Being able to handle complexity, being able to handle those situations where the kettle's just boiled, the porridge has burnt onto the pot, the doorbell's gone and the child's been sick. Being able to handle all those things going on, like a really skilled air traffic controller. And then the last thing is response inhibition, being able to stop ourselves doing the first thing that occurs to us. It's a really, really important skill in life. I wish I was better at it. That thing that stops you saying the first thing in, in your head. We all need it at Christmas, don't we? And there's a thing we mustn't say to, to Auntie Mary. There's a thing we stop ourselves. So this cluster of skills, again, you can see why that might be really, really useful for parenting. Okay, so we, we know how in ELC we can foster stress regulation. We do it through the nurture that we provide and realizing the ambition and the quality framework are really, really strong on the kinds of positive relationships that develop stress regulation. So what helps develop this executive function, this remembering, choosing actions, handling complexity, switching from one thing after another, handling everything life throws at us? Um, so <clears throat> here's a formal thing. Uh, what develops executive function is cognitively challenging, goal-directed, purposive activity in a social context. So if you want that translated into English, it's doing interesting things and talking about it to adults who care. And that's what develops executive function. So high quality ESC develops these two factors that help people who experience adversity in childhood to turn out to be okay parents and breaks that intergenerational link. Quite powerful, aren't we? We're messing around outside, splashing in puddles, laughing, having fun, chatting to the children about it. And we are building these two vital skills. So let's look at stress regulation in action. And this is such a poor choice because my partner is currently at Gatwick Airport with a delayed flight. Uh, who knows what's going to happen? Um, so I have chosen to do uh, a picture of an airport with loads and loads of cancellations. It's sort of a classic 
stressful situation of modern life. And we've probably all been through a version of that with planes, trains or automobiles in some way. So I'm gonna use this as an example to look at stress regulation in action. How do we cope with these things? What helps us cope with stresses? And this is important thinking about children because life is going to be full of stresses. So what do they need to cope with stresses when they're a parent in an airport with the flights being cancelled or they have an important appointment to get to? So here's some of the things that help us cope. So being able to prioritise what to do and keeping as calm as possible. We're not helped if we flap around the airport like a, a, a mad thing, screaming our heads off. That's not going to help us get home. So yes, those are important. And there's, this, there's the stress regulation stuff. There's the well-being stuff, being able to, to, to manage our emotions. Yeah, really important. So is this. So is being able to ask for information, being able to understand what we're told, being able to read the information boards, being able to decipher you know, those snack tickets that they give you if the flight's really delayed and you have to work out you're allowed a cup of tea and half a biscuit. So how do you get a decent snack out of that? Being able to read the information, being able to fill in the forms so that we can reclaim our luggage and all those verbal skills of asking for help. Those green things, that's literacy. That's listening and talking, reading and writing. So it turns out that literacy is really important for day-to-day -day coping with stressful situations. So is stuff like, reasoning about consequences. If we do this, then that. So if a flight's delayed for another hour, we're going to have to ring so-and-so. If we leave the airport now, we'll abandon our luggage, so we better not just run away, although that's what we want to do. Lots of calculation going on. We need to check we've got enough money to cope for now and problem solve how to deal with that. Goodness me, that's numeracy and mathematics. So it turns out that as well as well-being, Attainment is really important for building resilience because day to day, we need those things to help us manage difficult times. Okay, if that doesn't convince you, how about this picture? If, it, if you're getting into hot water, show people a picture of uh, uh, a baby playing and everything will be all right. And here's a question, what matters more to that child? Is that child developing learning about physics, about fluids, is the child, expressing joy and enhancing their well-being and does the difference make any sense to them of course it doesn't and so the difference doesn't make sense to us either so here's my second key message for the evening we sometimes see discourse in policy and in social media again that sets well-being in opposition to learning but we need to see them in partnership because well-being supports learning, supports emotional resilience, supports learning, supports well-being. And that's why in Scotland we have these genius indicators, which are Shinari, which hold all of those things together. Okay, so it's time to hear from another setting. So I will stop sharing and hand over to Lynn. Lynn, who's next? I've forgotten. I've lost my running order. <laughs> Next, we have Tracy Eccleston, who is a childminder from North Lanarkshire, and she has done a lot of work with children and families around supporting their well-being and supporting their learning. So we're going to hear how she has really helped children and families to cope and adapt during the pandemic and beyond. So can you share some examples of the strengths that you believe have helped your service when we're going through the pandemic? Um, on a personal level, it was a very challenging time um, due to the uncertainty of the pandemic and what effect it would have on my family and, of course, my business. However, what I tried to ensure that I did was have a, a really positive attitude and I was really honest and compassionate and understanding and supportive as much as I could with families that I looked after and of course my colleagues. Every week um, I would also do a, a social distance visit to see the children, just checking how they were and help if they needed any advice, help parents if they needed any information and, and support because it wasn't 
been easily accessible at that time either. Um, I think I was far-sighted enough um, to understand that by keeping in touch with the children and families every week, it kept our connection really, really close. So that left little disruption for them and an easy transition back when we came back to norm normality as well. So you were describing there lots of really positive things about your service, but we also know that there was lots of challenges um, at, through the pandemic. And I just wonder if you had any kind of things you would like to share about the, those kind of challenges um, when you've been supporting in the children and families. Yeah, of course. Um, I suppose what comes to mind is during the pandemic, um, a lot of the community services were stopped or they were limited, um, and some of them still got backlogs. Among the areas I felt that were really impacted for were the speech and language area and children that were on the autistic non-verbal spectrum. Other areas I looked at were ACEs online and social factors um, that may impact the children as many parents have lost their jobs or were on lower pay and um, just the impact of the lockdown. Um, I was acutely aware that the trauma of isolation caused some development delays um, the National Trauma Training provided me with all levels of essential awareness and understanding on how trauma really impacts behaviour, allowing a wee bit more insight on how it helped any of the behaviours that came out of the pandemic, because we were seeing a few because a lot of the children hadn't been mixing. Um, the other areas that I looked at as well um, that I thought were slightly different um, before the pandemic um, was the excellent relationship we used to have with nurses and schools. We really worked in partnership with them. Post pandemic, um, as there have been as there have been more door drops, there were fewer quality interactions with the nursery staff um, and the school staff um, to collaborate and cascade information about the children. So can you identify any changes that you've observed in the way that the children are using the spaces within your setting or the way that you're now having to interact with the children to support their play and learning uh, in this post pandemic period? Um, however, what I did notice was when groups started back, um, the younger children I noticed reacted to the increased noise more. Um, I think because some children um, had been um, at home and hadn't been at groups. Um, I felt that when we were in a bigger group, um, they needed you to be inside a lot more. So, can you share with us some of the positive work that you've been doing to support the kind of healing process for yourself and for the children and families using your service? Of course, um, my colleagues and I um, were very fortunate enough to have a fellow childminder with the foresight to identify an unused overgrown area in her local allotment, um, which was just attached to where she was. And um, that area, she felt, could be developed into a really authentic outdoor learning experience for the children. So that outdoor play area was set up during the pandemic to allow the children to mix outdoors in a safe space full of really rich natural resources. It was very basic at the time. It's a, more, a much more developed space now. It's what support you would like to see further from ourselves, the Care and Spectre, or any of the other organisations that you kind of work closely with um, to help those gaps that are supporting the children and family going forward? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think the first thing um, that comes to mind would be to have more early years in childcare meetings for mm -hmm. the home not just individuals, so like a focus group um, is at the moment, uh, at the moment, I feel it's very fractured and there's no fluidity between the private and public sectors. And I feel we all have our own challenges, but I think we all have similar challenges. And I think if we work together as a group, we could all work out, you know, um, whatever that may be. So if everyone worked as a team, talked about their challenges and shared good practice, I think this would benefit everyone working within the sector. I think another area that would be beneficial is an across sector, what to expect from in inspection. So something easy to read, like a reference guide, such as what essential paper paperwork we should have. So what should we have there and what really we shouldn't be having 
on file so that we're not taking up all our time and paperwork and concentrating on what we're doing with the children. Another area moving on from um, inspections would be um, gaining more understanding um, would be good in how to support families, especially as a childminder. Um, for instance, you know, how we refer families that maybe need support, you know, or children that need support. And I know that nurseries and schools have a wee bit more kind of exposure to that. Um, so even if it came down to the local council or whoever, you know, just to give us a bit more training on how to access that type of information within the critical services and gain a bit more how to understand how how we can um, support those challenges, then that would be fantastic. James, you're on, you're muted. <laughs> We're not hearing you, James. Still struggling to pick up your voice, James. Try yeah. again, James. That's are we on? Yes, yes. Hooray. You, are <laughs> you can't imagine how lucky you were not to be able to hear me. So um, I'm just going to fiddle with the computer. Um, so talking about dealing with stresses, what happened was my internet connection failed. So I got thrown out of the, um, I got thrown out of the call. <laughs> so I had to, go, had to go and restart everything. Um, is there a slide coming through? Yes, James, you're fine. Fantastic. Yep. So this is appropriately entitled Ups and Downs. I can tell you the plane's taken off, um, so that's good. But on the other hand, my, my internet failed. So there we are. Um, so listening to Tracy there, it's really interesting, again, the, the, the balance of different things. And I, I love the way she said that some of the children still need the adults in sight more. It shows how important our relationships with them are to their recovery and we can be led with the children in that but also her really account clear account of what's needed and she had some some few messages for for different agencies there and as Jackie said uh, at the start part of the purpose of this evening is to launch a survey so that the care inspector can have a dialogue with you about how things are and what's needed so what I'm going to share with you in the next five minutes is some some real data uh, that we have from Highland about just, just how things are for children, but also how things are for settings, um, because the children need to recover from the pand pandemic, but so do we and what we provide. So there's a really mixed picture around the country. So if you're sitting in a setting thinking we've got some children who are more wobbly who we, than we'd expect, we've got some children who it's, you know, like they're, they're sort of a year younger in terms of their routines or their language or their coordination or whatever what you're seeing is is how the children are and that in a way is 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 reassuring um, because we also know the way to build um, their their skills development well-being and, and and progress by providing the, the high quality environment. you might even be seeing some some unexpected strengths um the, the remark in one of the videos that some of the children are kinder you know they've adapted to 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 this the state of things and this is a really important point we're seeing children who have made adaptations and we can help them adapt back by the spaces experiences and interactions we provide so <clears throat> everybody wants to look at the graph at half past seven on a Thursday, don't they so here's a graph that we can all look at it's not as bad as it looks what this is 
is it's a snapshot we take in Highland every year as children go into P1 as part of their transition and then we collate everything and it gives us a sense of how children are doing across the whole authority in terms of their development. So each of the columns is a particular area of development so there's movement, coordination, routine, social play and then language understanding and language expression and then each of the colours is a different year. So the blue blobs on the left is 2019 and the green blob next to it is the first pandemic year 2021. So you can see there the gaps, you can see the dip in children's development, whether it's language, movement, coordination, social or play skills associated with the pandemic. The dark blue blob for each cluster of blobs is this year. So these are the children who are now in P1 at the end of their, their preschool year. And you can see that for some of the things like movement on the left, it started to recover. But for some things, and these are the harder bits of development, like language understanding, language expression, social skills, and play, there isn't a complete recovery here yet. There is still a gap. So this is what we're seeing. This is how the children are at the moment. And these are the children we need to adapt to. And if you've heard me talk about this before, you will know that I think, because it's what the research tells us, we're going to need to adapt for these children for the next not next year, two years, when you're going to need to adapt for the next 10, 12 years, so that we make sure that schools are supporting them as they need and, and other services too. Okay, so the children are different to normal years. So if we're seeing wobbles and gaps, that's what we should expect. But it's not just for children who changed. What we could offer during the pandemic, because of the quite proper and correct public health guidance, our settings changed too, and we changed. And it's not always easy to get all of that back. If we take a look around our settings, in lots of ways, they're not necessarily quite where they were in 2019. They're not necessarily quite where we'd like them to be. So again, I'm gonna show you some data from, from Highland. And we just asked a couple of hundred earliest practitioners a year ago, just to say, which aspects of your offer have you struggled to get back, or are you still struggling to get back, or you've got them back, but you don't feel they're firmly established yet? So this is data from a year ago, and here are the things they said were tricky to get back. And it's an amazing variety of things. So bringing soft toys back, some children still anxious about soft toys, some Staff members still anxious. This was a year ago about soft toys. The cooking and baking things, the water, the messy play, getting back to free flow routines, sharing stories, parents coming in was a big one and still is a big one for some settings. Singing, role play, blankets, going out and about in the community, you know, seeing the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, and doing all that kind of learning that goes on in those rich community encounters. So this was a year ago. So quite a lot of these things have have moved on. But it's just to show the, the impact of the pandemic on children and the impact of the pandemic on what settings can provide. And there's still work going on all around the country to try and build that back. So here's, here's the sort of last question of the, the evening is how is it for you and what do you need? And I can't overemphasize that the following, if you're seeing these things, this is normal and to be expected. So if you're seeing developmental gaps, strengths and weaknesses in odd patterns among children, children, you, families, you wouldn't expect them to have any difficulties, they have difficulties. If you're seeing or experiencing wobbles and fears among the children, but also among us, among the adults, because we're human too. If you're seeing gaps in what you can offer in terms of experiences, spaces and interactions, you're not alone. There are other settings in that position. Or if you've gotten back, but they're now or still under huge pressure, you know, people are still going off sick, there's pressures on staffing, all kinds of things, it's difficult to do this. So if you're seeing all of those, that's normal. And the question which Jackie will come on to in just a minute is what might help. But before we do that, 
I'd like to do another Menti. Uh, so let's see if the internet connection will let me do this. Just bear with me for a moment and I will put up another question. Uh, so if, if some colleagues can give me a happy yip yip if they can see a slide. And this is, has it come up guys? Yes, you, you're fine James. And that'd be fantastic. So this one, asking you to menti.com on your phones or on another browser window, pop in the code. And remember, this is completely anonymous, so no one's knowing what you're saying. Just to say, what's been harder for you to bring back? What was harder for you? Some things to bring back. So yeah, so just take time to pop in anything. James, we're losing your sound a little. There's a lot of interference. Okay. Did you get enough about Bementi and how to do I it? I think we did, sure. though. I'm sure okay. colleagues have got that. Yeah. So go to Menti, pop in the code, and just anonymously, because no one knows who's saying what, um, what things have been hard for you to bring back in your setting. Getting out of groups, definitely. Yeah. The stay and play, parents, yeah. Parents coming into the home, absolutely. Yeah, curious play. There's, yeah, okay. Staff confidence. We've all had a knock, <laughs> and it's not over yet. Yeah, home visits. Yeah, I'm just going to let this grow for a while, and you can you can watch it. fun yeah connections with rooms yes within setting connections those are harder yeah families out in the community soft furnishings such common theme intergenerational play absolutely yes that's still tough budgets yeah there's some of the background around us um yeah Forest fun sessions. Okay, so thank you. Please continue inputting, um, and in five ten minutes or so, we'll put that back up so that everybody can see it. So please carry on adding things to that, and I'm going to hand over to Jackie, who's going to talk about some of the supports which are available, but also, as I said, to start that dialogue about what else you need. Hi. Well, before that, James, we've still got to hear from someone else in the sector. I'm so sorry. I was so flustered by my ears not working, I but I completely forgot. Let's watch it. you off kilter. <laughs> before we Over do, to. I just want to let everyone know we are going to hear from another wonderful provider in a wee minute. That's Julie from Tower View Nursery in Glasgow. And she's going to really talk about how they have supported children to become resilient and to bring that fun back in to the nursery. But I just want to let you all know as well that I've been keeping a wee eye on time and we will have a chance for a few questions um, at the end after this night's video. So the way that we'll do that is the chat function has been opened. So if you do have any burning questions, anything that you would like to pose to Jackie and James, then please write that in the chat during this video and then we'll look at the common themes that are coming th uh, through and we'll ask Jackie and James a few questions at the end. So that's now available for you to do while you're watching this next video. What do you think it really was? What was the strength that helped you just to get through the pandemic? Um, definitely our effective communication skills. Definitely that. As I said before, it's about keeping yourself up to date with accurate um, information because we were at the forefront sharing with our parents and making sure at the beginning as well seven days a week this was happening because you were being informed if any incidents happened over the weekend. So you had to have everything in place. Again, what we found out, and again, this is through our communication that some families that you thought were maybe doing okay and didn't need as much support through speaking to them, emailing, using our Facebook, sending letters to children, 
the families were then more keen to phone back and talk to you. We found out people that lost their jobs through the pandemic, families that had separated due to the pandemic, deaths as well. So again, your whole dynamics of the families that you had changed. Making sure our children's well-being was okay as well, because you imagine the children that were here, it was a big change for them, didn't have all their friends. They were now in bubbles. So we had to make sure that, they, that we were listening to our children and we, to make sure that they knew they could still have fun, play, laughter. That was still allowed. That was still going to go on. So you had to make sure that the children's well-being was in listening to them. Before COVID first started, our front door was full of children's pictures, a few policies and things that parents needed to know. And what I realised when walking through that front door during COVID, it changed. And it was quite gloom because, are you wearing a mask? Is there only one person coming forward? That was, that was not the kind of ethos that we promote, especially when you come to our front door. But that changed slowly but surely throughout it. We had a rainbow to represent the NHS. We put up thank you letters from people because, again, the staff and the children organised boxes for, children, for, for patients that were in hospital and couldn't get anybody to, to visit, couldn't get anybody to take in any toiletries that they needed. So again, the staff and the children organised that and got carloads to go over. So again, that was a really good way of, of getting the children involved. So again, our door then changed to, to reflect what this building should be about ensuring that children have laughter, have fun and happiness, and know that they're loved when they come in here. Realising ambition um, was a really good support tool for us as well. 3.5, when things aren't straightforward. 3.4, play. These were really good. We, we, we were able to tap in. What an amazing resource it's there. It was as if they knew it was going to happen. It was great. It was so good that we had that here that we could look into. Is there anything else that's still a challenge as you recover from the pandemic? We um, we had to change our settling in policy um, during COVID and post COVID. And again, I think it's remembering that when you have new parents that are starting, remembering to share with them why you're doing these things. Um, because a lot of children or our COVID children, as you would say, that they went, and their parents as well, have they've lost a year or two years of being in nursery. So again, it's been mindful of, of making sure that you're asking them questions. Um, when a lot of the children came back as well, they, they did struggle, some of our children. We, had, we identified three groups of children when they came back. Um, we had one group of children that had been sheltered throughout COVID and they were struggling to reconnect, to make positive attachments and to settle. So again, there we made longer settling in periods. We worked really hard with the children. We did fairy labours with them to see how their wellbeing and their interactions were. Our second group were the ones that came back so eager and excited to explore. So again, we had to make sure that their needs were being met. And again, that's where our outdoor area is, is really good. We got them out because they were just wanting to be involved in everything. So they were involved in creating a magical area outside on a limited budget. But again, our staff are really good at upcycling and they got the children involved to do all of that. We then recognised we had a third group and they were the children that attended throughout. So see the noise, the busyness really affected the children when they came back. We proudly now have a sense of the room in here that was created by the children and the team. And again, this was recognised by our team throughout COVID that this was needed. And we actually have children that now will say, I think I'd like to go to the sensor room because they recognise themselves, that they're not comfortable in the playroom, that, that there's something that they're, that they're maybe not able to articulate. But when they go up to the sensor room and they've relaxed, they're then able to talk it through with the team. So that has been, that's that again, you could maybe say that was a challenge, but was it? It was really an opportunity again to get it right for our children. And you're talking yourself about opportunities, which is great because there's always opportunities to move things forward, isn't there? So where do you see the opportunities now, now that we're moving out of the pandemic, um, to work with other services, with communities and with your families to kind of 
help support any of those gaps in children's and families' experiences? During COVID, um, we were the eyes and ears for Social Working for Health because they weren't able to do home visits. They were, it was mostly telephone calls. So we were actually the only service, education was the only service seeing these children. Again, social workers, so it would be through windows and certain things like that. So I would say that our relationship with health and social work, although it was really good, it's even better now because they saw us as a good resource to be able to see what was happening. Yeah. What, what's preschool education about? It's about making the Scottish Government want us to be the best place to grow up in Scotland. They want it for children to have the best place to grow up in. So we need to all work together to ensure that we're all doing this. This is vital. We all need to work together. You can't just be a lone soldier. You have got to. Collegiate working is the way. We know and we understand that recovery does take time and it takes effort. So we're really keen to hear what you would like to see from us, from the Care Inspectorate and indeed from other agencies or other organisations um, to support any gaps in children and families' really experiences. Good. Your practice notes are great. I love the Care Inspectorate practice notes. They are a good support and good for reference and um, they're really good to share with the team. Um, more webinars like today, I think it'd be really good to also talk to our training establishments to say to them what we saw and how where we felt students had struggled. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, I can't believe that we're we're approaching ten to eight at night, and the time just seems to have travelled really, really quickly. And I know I might be standing between yourselves and perhaps some relaxation or indeed some food. So I'll I'll try my best to keep to time here. Um, before I go on to just to talk a little bit about the survey. Um, yes, thank you, James. That's just what I was keen for you to do. So thanks very much. Really great to see that. And, and it's interesting. I think I said, colleagues, that um, last week we had 400 people on. We've got over 200 tonight. And there's there's some similarities and um, some additional views here, which is great. The parental involvement was the outstanding um, feature on week one, and it's very much there. Anything else? Let me see, James. We, yes, this the stay and play, the staff confidence and well-being, and parents coming back in. So that that's really really interesting. Anything you wanted to add to that, James? Just before I move on. Just seeing this confidence thing so strong. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the the knock that everybody's had, but just how important it is for by providing loving interesting environments to children and talking to them that's the confidence we need to recover and the sense of the sense of fun in it and they'll be fine they'll be fine if we can do that <laughs> yeah okay i'll put this down jackie so you okay can... thanks james and i think caroline's just going to pop up the the last few slides but just at this moment i wonder if i could just pause and thanks james um, I think he's really reassured us about the long term recovery messages and indeed the dedication and the skills across our ELC community in building that resilience every day with every interaction for our children, our families and our communities and indeed our staff. So a huge thanks to James for his fantastically stimulating input tonight. I said at the beginning um, of the evening that this is the start of a national conversation that, you know, we at the Care Inspector are very keen to work in collaboration with the sector. So we are excited to say that this week and next week will be across all our social media platforms launching this Recovery Place survey because what we want to do is give you the opportunity to tell us more individually or indeed as a staff team, they can all anonymous. We want to hear about your observations on your children, on your play experiences indoors and outdoors, on what are the challenges 
What are the challenges in re-engaging parents back into the setting? So we've got, we've worked with James and with our own project team to develop this um, recovery play um, survey. And so we're absolutely keen if you could spread the word, look out for it, it'll be coming in the provider update. And that will really give us an opportunity to delve deeper, to look at what you're telling us, to analyse that and to try and target our support in the future. So other next steps that are around in, in relation to what else we want to do, we're continuing this conversation, but let me just pick up on, on two um, questions that came up um, through those videos. We were really, really keen to say to everyone that we're committed to trying to work with local authorities to clarify in particular Tracy's question around the paperwork required for childminders. Um, so, you know, we're giving our commitment that we are actively looking at that. And we're also trying to develop further guidance to the sector to support what an inspection day might look like. And not only for yourselves, but really for children and for families. So we're committed to developing that work. And um, we're also, if you want to just move on, that would be great. Thanks. After tonight, we are working, we'll continue the work with James, with our project team, with colleagues in Scottish Government, with our colleagues in Education Scotland to analyse and to look at the data and the feedback and your comments and your observations. And that will help target our further webinars and in-person support and videos and all the different ways that we can try and support the sector. I want to just pause for a minute because I know we've got, you know, seven minutes or so left. And I wonder if I could just ask just before I go to the, the last few slides, my colleague Anthony, if there was any questions that you wanted to pull out, Anthony, or any indeed any comments for James or myself, can I just ask you to pop in, Anthony? Yeah, absolutely, Jackie. There's no no specific real questions at the moment. Um, it's maybe worth mentioning that in the chat, you will be able to find a link to, to James's slides from tonight, and, and they're also available on James's website. Um, but I think the, the common theme that's really running through is, is just touching on what you've said there. There's a lot of people chatting about um, the importance of collaboration, working together and, and how we, we keep this going forward, you know, and, and are people very keen to, to keep engaging in this way. Uh, it seems to be the main theme that's coming out at the moment. Super. Thanks very much, Anthony. And I know we, we are getting towards, a, you know, quite a late point in the night, particularly for people that have been working with, with children and families, and I'm very aware of that. So, you know, we want to make sure that we, we get people finished in time, and we're just so very grateful for your commitment and engagement tonight. So just to remind everyone that, you know, if you please visit our, our hub and look, we've got a whole range of resources and practice notes, particular attention to our latest one, Growing My Potential, which is a practice note for staff working with one to two year olds. But as uh, James reminds us, we, we don't work rigidly, do we, with age groups with children? But please have a look at that one. That's quite a recent one. Um, and My Active World's there. That's great, Caroline. If you want to just move on to the last couple, that would be super. And those are other practice notes around keeping children safe, our meal times, supporting curiosity and exploration. So please just delve around and tell us what you think. And, and lastly, in the next slide, we're just reminding everyone, please look out for the survey. After tonight, everyone that's been on the webinar will be emailed the link. We'll have it on all our social media platforms. Please tell us what you think about tonight. Pose questions, reflections, give us ideas for future support. We really want to hear from you. So look out and ask colleagues to please complete the survey. Just before I finish, I wonder if I could just pause and pay thanks in particular 
to the four settings that worked with our inspectors to put together these videos because um, you'll all know these things never happen easily and it takes quite a lot of work and commitment and the settings, you know, Little Daisies, Sarah, High Flyer, Senga, Tracy, our childminder um, colleague and Towerview Nursery, Julie and colleagues from there. A huge thanks for your collaboration and working closely with us. We're very, very grateful. And I suppose at the end of the day, we've only got four minutes left and I think I might get you all finished early and get you to a, a, a relaxation uh, of, of the end of your day, which I'm sure is very well deserved. I'd also like to just again thank James and say to everyone that once we have the survey in, we'll be working together, we'll be looking, we're very, very keen to get some further reflection and feedback from yourselves so that we can then understand and in, in, in a more national focused way, you know, what are the issues? And we'll be beginning to unravel all of those tonight, but we want to really think carefully about how we target our support and our improvement and continue to support the sector and this forever and you know challenging time, not only post you know pandemic, but people are still working with all um the the you know the challenges and opportunities around the ELC and expansion. So to finish off with colleagues, um, I'd like to just, I couldn't finish the evening without just sharing, you know, a last image of, of a child, which I think no matter, you know, what hat we have on tonight, what hat we have on tomorrow in relation to our own work, that we're reminding ourselves that really, you know, at the end of the day, this little one, this little two-year-old, is very, very focused on his own little actions, his own splashing, the noise that it makes, the enjoyment. I don't think he is at all focused on, oh, is this wonderful splashing in this puddle helping my well-being? Is it promoting my learning? Am I focused on a particular framework, the quality framework, realising the ambition. We all know that's not the case. What we know is as adults, we want this, we want to have fun, to feel safe, to take risks that feel okay for him to have enjoyment, to know that if they are in any discount caring adult, they give them comfort and give them careers. A huge thanks to the project team, to Lynn Alexander, Anthony, Cara, Caroline, and in particular to the providers, to James, um, for your great dedication to taking this project forward. But mostly to all of you that have given up some time tonight after a, a long day at work, a huge thanks and I very much hope that you've enjoyed the webinar. And please, please fill in the survey because we are we're here to learn and to shape the support. James, do you have anything to add? Just wonderful. So many people came along uh, to think and reflect together. Um, thanks for having me along. Super. Thanks, James. Have a nice evening and a good rest, colleagues. Thank you for your support. Bye.